Muy buenas tardes. En nombre del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Inter Development Bank, we welcome you to the series of webinars walking together towards the future, where we explore how key aspects of development have changed over the last 15 years and what our countries will need over the next decade. To get us started, we have the lead specialist for social protection who will talk about inputs in health and education. Then we will have a conversation between the president of the IADB, Luis Alberto Moreno, Julio Guayotto, and then from this regional center for innovation from Asia and the Pacific from the UN Development Program, Elena Cañal, medical director of patient innovation, and Marcelo Cabrol, manager of the social sector at the IDB. The event will be in English and in Spanish, and there will be interpretation. Click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select the language you would wish you wish to hear. The lower level of your screen and select the language. Antes de empezar la conversación, les invitamos a Before we begin the conversation, we invite you to take a look at a few projects and initiatives financed by the IDB in health and education over the last 15 years. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. I'd like to begin by thanking Elena Cañao, uh, Julio Cuayo, Marcelo Cabrol, and uh, our own Ines, who is uh, in our office in uh, Argentina. Uh, but let me, uh, you know, begin by framing a little bit this conversation uh, and talking a little bit about how we look at issues of education and health. Uh, clearly, things have changed significantly. I remember back. Uh, 15 years ago, um, we were all about financing and building schools, and health was about building hospitals and putting the equipment in place. Uh, we didn't necessarily pay at the time all the attention uh, of the users uh, or of the quality of the services that were received by those users. And uh, therefore, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, today, we are more in an era of health tech and edutech. Uh, with, a, with a tremendous focus on services 
uh, not only on students, but patients and at the end, the end user. And today we know that both education and health are two of the most important ways in which governments can reduce inequality and improve the quality of life for our citizens. And nothing is more central than in what should be eventually a new social contract, a new deal, uh, than the issues surrounding education and health, especially in our hemisphere. And here there's a lot to do still. And our speakers, uh, Elena Cañao is a founder at of patient innovation and is a leader in health innovation. Julio Cagliotto is uh, the N UNDP's regional uh, innovation center in Asia Pacific. And equally, Marcelo Carola, our own manager for the social sector. The three of them will give us a picture as they see not only what we have learned, but more importantly, how we are ready to embrace the future and already doing so. And we're also going to be joined by Ines Tristao, who is one of our lead specialists in the health uh, area of the bank. We love, I, I would therefore like to start uh, with a big presentation uh, by Ines, who will tell us how much has happened over these past few years, uh, followed by a conversation with Elena, Julio, and Marcelo uh, about how we see the future of both health and education in our region. So Ines, bienvenida, please go ahead. Buenas tardes, Presidente Moreno. Eh, buenas good afternoon, tardes. President Moreno. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me put up my presentation, please. Bueno, creo que ahora todos la ven, ¿verdad? Okay, I think everyone can see it now. When I was invited to participate in this conversation, I was asked to do something very simple, which was to summarize in under 10 minutes over 15 years of progress made in health and education in our region. And I started to think about it and wondered how exactly I was going to do that. It wasn't simple at all, actually. But then I remembered an interview that I had seen with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and he talked about the process of writing and publishing his um, novel, his Piece de Resistance, 100 Years of Solitude. And I loved that interview because it reminds me very much of the work we do here at the bank. And I would like to share that interview with you now. When Mercedes told me that we had touched bottom, we could do nothing else, I had a car. And so I took that car to Monte de Piedra and I pawned it. Okay, so you've heard from Garcia Marquez now, such a great author with a very good idea. And even that wasn't enough. He didn't have money in order to write his novel. So that was the challenge that he faced. And that made me think about what it means to persevere. Why? Because perseverance is here in everything that we do at the bank. And I would like to flesh out that idea a bit more. 15 years ago, we thought about working on making things universal. What do I mean by that? Working together with countries in our region to ensure that all people had access to health and education services. We knew that back then, almost one out of every four children in the most vulnerable families did not finish elementary school. We also knew that only 58% of children had access to preschool. And what about health? We weren't doing much better in that area. We knew that over 300,000 children died every year before they turned five. It was truly a tragedy, and especially so if you think that the cause of this was that they had no access to services. It was truly horrible. So what did we do? We worked hand in hand with countries in the region on many projects, projects such as the Health 
Mesoamerica, Salud Mesoamerica initiative. What this initiative has shown is that it is possible to close gaps in coverages in maternal and child health in the most vulnerable areas. We're talking about small districts in Panama, all the way to indigenous communities in the area projects, such as conditional transfer programs. These projects have shown that it is possible to raise the level of educational and health coverage in preventive services in almost every country in the region. And these have been the programs that have been the most evaluated over the years. And there are also innovative projects such as Tiquichuela in Paraguay. This project has shown that it is possible to teach differently. That is much more student-centered and based on critical thinking. These are three out of many projects. To be specific, out of 213 projects over the last 15 years of work in this area, uh, we have invested over $22 billion. Now, all of this effort, this investment has made it possible for this joint work to contribute to greatly improve the data and statistics in the region. Today, we know that 96% of children finish elementary school. Today, we know that access to preschool has risen to 78%. And another important data point is that this has been done without a gender gap. Now, what about health? What we see in the region today is the lowest mortal, infant mortality rate or child mortality rate in history. And this decrease in the mortality rate has meant an increase in life expectancy. We're talking about, and it's been a three year increase, which is quite significant. What this means is that children who were born today live longer than their parents did, and they will live much longer than their grandparents did. So that is a great outcome. However, have we done it all? No, there's still a long way to go. This is stage one. But before I get into that, I would like to show you the continuation of Garcia Marquez's story because he's written his novel now and he needs to get it published. So that is stage two. Let's hear what he has to say. So I finished it. We went to the post office, Mercedes and I did. It was 700 pages long. So they waited at the post office and they told me it would cost 83 pesos to send it from Mexico to Argentina. And I said, I only, Mercedes said, I only have 45. So I said, okay, it's really easy. Let's split it in half. So I said, weigh this book up until 45 pesos. And so they started and they would remove some. It was like slicing deli meat. And when it got to 45 pesos, I wrapped those pages up. I sent those off and we kept the rest. So you heard from Garcia Marquez who basically didn't have enough money. So he had to split his novel in half and he only sent half of it from Mexico to Argentina to be published. But that makes me think of perseverance because he that which is universalization. But we're still lacking stage two. This second stage has a name, which is quality. Why quality? Because we know today that children in our region go to school. But what we see is that they are still in the lowest rankings worldwide. And we see a significant gender gap when it comes to performance, especially in STEM subjects. Now, what about health? What we see in the health sector is that there are still many deaths 
that occur that were preventable. And we know that over 62% of these deaths could be avoided if there were access to better quality services. So what are we going to do about that? What are, how are we going to move forward? Before I do so, I'd like to show you the end of the interview so you can see how Garcia Marquez was able to send the second half of his novel from Mexico to Argentina. So we went home and Mercedes found the last things that we had left to pawn. Those things were the heater that I used for writing because I can write under any conditions unless I'm cold. My hair dryer that I used for my head and the blender that I had used always to make smoothies for my kids, but they were big, they were older and didn't really need that. So she took that to Monte de Piedra and she was given 50 pesos for it. So we went back with, to the post office with the rest of the novel and they weighed it and said, this will cost 48 pesos. Mercedes paid her 50 pesos. She got two back in change. And I realized when we left the post office that I was really pissed off. And she said, only thing that could happen now is that this novel might not be any good. So you saw there how Garcia Marquez financed the second half of his novel and sending it to Argentina. And we all know that story, right? That is his, his most successful novel. And just as for him, his novel was a success. For us, the first part of our story has been a success. We have been able to greatly broaden what services are offered. I think we've reached universalization. Now we need to move on to part two of the story, which is ensuring that what is offered is of high quality. And there, I think that we will be able to reach that point a lot faster. Why? For three reasons. First of all, because we, now we know a lot more than we did before. Two, because now we have better technology than we did 15 years ago. And three, because we know clearly now that now more than ever, we need to put people in the center of what we do. And we will continue to do so with the same perseverance we have always had. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ines. I love that you brought Garcia Marquez, my idol as a Colombian, but also as a Latin American. I remember something he used to say when he talked about birth. And he said that all human beings are born because their mothers have lit the way, but that life is what forces them to be reborn and to do it themselves time and time again. And that is essential in education and what we're talking about here. So thank you for bringing that up. And I'd like to move on to Marcelo. We have worked on technology related issues very much and it's clear that technology is a great tool that allows us to do what hadn't been done before in education. And today more than ever, the digital revolution when it comes to health and education is like a new path ahead of us. Just imagine if Garcia Marquez had been able to write 100 years of solitude on a computer with a single click and without paying his 48 pesos, he could have sent his novel directly to the publisher in Argentina. Anyway, go ahead, Marcelo. Hello, President. It's obvious that I'm new to technology and I think that the premise that technology can help us uh, make that jump to quality is important. But there's always a caveat, a but. And I'd like to give you three buts, three myths that we need to overcome if we want technology to improve quality. The first one, I think, in the context of COVID, it's obvious to everyone that the first myth we need to do away with is that being face-to-face -face is, is 
irreplaceable. We've always said that in education and in health, if you're not there, then the quality you're getting is second rate. That's the premise that we've used. Now, with COVID, now we have to think about how remote education, remote te health, telehealth and diagnoses, how we can make these high quality, these need to be of the best quality because these are the services that people who have the least really need to be able to access. So the first myth is that if we're using technology and we can't do anything face to face, that quality is second rate. The second myth is that technology up until now had been used to complement things. Let's talk about medicine, remote medicine and education. First in education, we used to use technology as a niche. We used it to teach English where there were no teachers who spoke English well enough to teach it, to complement teaching math where we didn't have enough teaching capacity. Now what we're seeing after COVID with technology is that this is no longer something that we use off to the side. It needs to be front and center in everything we do. It needs to, we need to use it in the programs we put together, but also in teaching. So it's no longer relegated to the back burner. And the third thing is data. We need to have data and information. This is no longer optional. It used to be something we called nice to have. We would say, okay, first let's fix services here and then let's deal with administration and data. Now, it's not just that we need data as we needed them before for evaluations and monitoring. Now the premise, President, is that technology such as artificial intelligence will help us use data to create programs that are better than the ones we had before. So these are the three great myths that we need to do away with so we can use technology. But let me finish with this. There are three myths and there's a magic formula that Ines brought up several times, which is the willingness to do things and to persevere. Uh, since I'm an impatient person, the main ingredient here is the willingness to do so and the willingness to persevere. We need to do that in order to do what we've done in the last 15 years. And I'll end with this. After 15 years in Great Britain, the university education system best rated by students is the University of Essex. Everything at the University of Essex is online. It's taken them 15 years to get to that point. I think that that's the promise that's out there and I think that we can achieve it. Thanks, Marcelo. Here in the US, the University of Arizona has developed something similar, which is, and it's one of the most innovative universities in this country. Julio. Innovative projects around the world. Uh, can you give us some examples uh, using technology innovation uh, that you think are really working? And more importantly, which ones do you think are uh, applicable to our part of the world? Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. So I think, you know, when it looks at uh, what's happening around the world, uh, it's worthwhile, as usual, thinking, you know, a very abused phrase, the future is here, uh, just not very evenly distributed, right? So, what are some interesting examples of use of technology? So, allow me to start with, uh, with an example that comes from, from China. It's not re necessarily immediately related to education or health. I think I can provide a bit of an example. I don't know how many of you have heard of a platform called Pinduoduo. Uh, it's a technology platform that has basically decided to take Alibaba at its own game. There's an incredible, and it, uh, basically serving rural farmers in rural areas. Uh, and has now 500 million monthly users, uh, has generated in the last year alone 300 million jobs, and has actually uh, a, tur and a turnover of $1.2 billion. And this is targeting poor people. Now, they were able to reach areas that were not uh, reachable before. Um, but the really interesting part is once uh, point of access, you know, being able to get uh, to these areas was sold, they started innovating. This is where the quality starts coming in. So for example, at the moment, we're experimenting with a model called uh, Duo Duo Schools, where they teach uh, rural farmers to become e-commerce stars. 
so they actually uh, have, uh, they can sell their products. So there is this phenomenon of, of farmers becoming stars um, in China and they sell their products directly to consumers. Now come COVID and all of a sudden this infrastructure has been activated to redesign supply chains almost on the spot. Uh, and create a whole new way of providing uh, food supplies and maintaining this over time. And when it comes to health, a little bit of a similar phenomenon we've seen happening with mutual aid in uh, China again. Uh, people, it's crowdfunding, basically you fund a project and you distribute, uh, uh, you know, you say, I want to do this and people chip in. With uh, mutual aid for insurance, what happens is that people only pay once the claim has been verified. And this has allowed actually to get uh, people health insurance, uh, even in areas that were never possible to do before. So I think in that sense, technology is just an enabler to radically rethink uh, the business model. Uh, and, I, and that goes very much back to a point of Marcelo, uh, that you know, we know that just providing a piece of technology doesn't necessarily automatically change a school or change a hospital. But if you use it strategically to rethink actually how to deliver the service, you can generate new things. On the point of data, I like to think, you know, that one of the big things that we can do is also insert much more preventative logics. So you probably know at this point in time, uh, many governments are experimenting with uh, measuring the sewage um, to actually see the level of COVID in a particular location. You can also, there is a, an experiment from the MIT that is looking at, again, looking at sewage where you can actually predict the level of obesity in a particular location. Uh, because obesity is associated with certain type of bacteria. I'm a very big fan of a project called Metasub, which actually teaches uh, uh, citizens uh, to go and take swaps of, of DNA inside uh, metro stations. And they feed, for example, uh, Rio de Janeiro before and after the Olympics. You can see how the microbiome of a city has changed. Um, and you can try to use this, for example, to prevent diseases. Uh, but also you can imagine a future where uh, transport or schools are infused with macrobiotics that are uh, designed for your guts and actually help your digestion, for example, if you wanted to go in that direction. So many different types of possibilities. Let me mention just a couple more examples. Um, we have been uh, observing quite closely a, a platform called Diksha in India, uh, which again was started because the question of just providing technology to schools and just computers has not necessarily improved the quality of education. And so what they created is a system that is really based on the autonomy of the teachers and the autonomy of the students to pick and choose their um, curricula and, and develop their courses accordingly. One of the things that you can do because there is technology and because there is data, they now produce something that looks like an ECG of education across the country. We have thousands, millions of teachers on this platform. You can actually see the heartbeat of education happening in a city in, uh, across the country at any point in time. And of course, with COVID, you could see for all of a sudden the education stopping. Um, uh, and you can really get a completely new type of insights into the way that uh, people learn, how they learn, and how can you actually customize learning based on their, uh, their particular interests. Uh, let me just conclude that one thing that I think would be interesting to explore is actually the intersection of these two areas. Again, in a preventative logic of health and education. So for instance, there seems to be uh, increasing evidence that pollution, air pollution causes mental stunting. Uh, or at least in, uh, obstacles to the level of education. So you could be a, a government that invests quite a lot in education, but if you have a high level of pollution, that might actually wipe off your investment. Um, so we are uh, looked at the work, for example, of an organization called Centric Lab that is trying to apply neuroscience to understand the stressors uh, that people that work in the condition of pollution, or for example, even high level of noises. And of course, this tends to be often in the poorest area of a particular city, how they actually impact the, the level of education. What can we do at the intersection of these two worlds? How can we inject preventative logics where I think it's an area that is very interesting to explore. Thank you, that's fascinating, uh, uh, Julio. Thank you very much. Elena, what you're basically doing in patient innovation is put uh, people and users at the center of what you do. Why don't you explain a little bit of how you got there and how it's working and how it can be you know scaled up 
uh, in, in Latin America. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So uh, when we are talking about health, people talk uh, always about put the patient in, in the center of the, the, the care. And we think in self-management, for, for instance, and give people more information about disease and try to um, teach and uh, uh, increase the literacy and uh, the knowledge about the disease. So uh, people, for instance, with uh, patients with diabetes can control better the, the disease. But this is self-management. Self, uh, the, the patient in innovation is another concept. It's not only that the patients can um, manage the diseases and know more about the body, their body and, uh, and their disease, but also that they have difficulties because they cannot uh, grab something, they have troubles in walking and they are facing that, they have poor quality of life, and because they have needs, they can um, try to find uh, new solutions and develop, develop new products and new strategies to deal with the, the disease. And this is the base of patient innovation. There are uh, lots of people that are always innovating because they have, the, uh, they, they have a disease or they care um, for their children, their um, fathers, their mothers that have diseases and, and they, they see that they are struggling with the problems related with disease and sometimes the traditional medicine that uh, I practice as a, a, a physician, um, we are very uh, focused on the physiopathology, trying to, uh, and this is uh, of course very good, trying to, to develop new drugs, uh, new devices, but sometimes the problem is another problem, is a problem with when, uh, when activity or something that interferes in the quality of life and the, the patient are not um, trying to, to uh, discover the cure, but um, have something that help him to deal with the disease. And, and I, I can give you one or two examples because I think it is better with, with examples to, to understand. One of the patients that uh, who, uh, we, we have in, in the, the platform, the patient innovation platform, is a, a patient with a Crohn's disease. A Crohn's disease is an inflammatory disease of the bowel. Uh, and he, he has inflammation uh, in the intestines, in the bowel, uh, and he, um, uh, he was submitted uh, uh, of several um, surgeries because the disease started uh, when he's 12 years old. And after many surgeries, he's, um, he is now with a back like the bag uh, that people with cancer, for instance, use uh, to, uh, uh, because they, they uh, don't have a part of the, the bowel and the, all the content of the bowel uh, is drained uh, in a bag. And when the producers of the bags think uh, on a good bag for, ev uh, uh, the, for having the content of the, the bowel, they think don't uh, smell, uh, don't have uh, some leakage, and um, this is the, 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 the problem for the producers and they try to, to, to solve that. But for the patient, one of the problems is to know when the bag is full. And to know when the bag is full, they need to touch the bag, look at the bag, because there is no sense there. Uh, and they don't know, they don't feel, um, and they need to touch. So for the patients, they, they need to go to the bathroom and see if uh, it's necessary to change or not the bag. Uh, Michael developed a sensor that it puts around the bag, and when the, the, the bag is filling, 
uh, and is uh, getting uh, full. There are uh, messages that are sent to the mobile phone. And when Michael look at the, the mobile phone, he can see the picture and the graphs and know, oh, I need to, to change my bag. So this is a type of the innovation that the producers didn't think, but a patient feel that, uh, that, uh, that needs. And there are lots of examples like that. Um, for instance, um, uh, uh, another patient that developed a shower shirt to take baths because uh, she was um, uh, also submitted uh, surgery um, because of a breast cancer and uh, then she, sh uh, the, she was also um, submitted to a mastectomy in the other breast and during a uh, large time, during months, uh, she had some sutures, uh, some uh, uh, drains and she cannot take a bath so she developed a shower shirt. So these are simple examples that for us are very simple, but for the patients, uh, they are the, 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 the obstacles to, to, to deal with the, the problems. So I think it's very important that this type of needs um, are taking um, a, a role and a place when we talk about health and about the problems of the patients. And sometimes we are really um, uh, worried with the physiopathology, but for the patients, the, the problems are the dealing with the daily activities. And technology in this case can, can be really very helpful with the new platforms, new change of ideas, dissemination of knowledge. And I think uh, there is a, a, a new world with all these exchange people that um, uh, ask for help, for solve problems and the crowd uh, can help, can bring new knowledge. And these times are very good for that. But if I may, just uh, uh, one more thing. One of the problems here with the technology is the increasing of inequalities and the gap between the people that can have access to the technologies and the people that uh, cannot use them because they don't have the, the knowledge for that, the money for that. So the technologies, I'm a fan of technologies, but we need to, to think on the gaps and technologies must be uh, an help for decrease the gap and not for increase the gap between uh, the people that have access and can manage the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for, for those very interesting uh, comments. And, uh, Marcelo, one of the temas, hablando de tecnología. Uh, Talking about technology, one of the, the issues uh, that we've dealt with at the bank is everything that has to do with artificial intelligence. And you headed this whole effort that we call Fair Lack in the bank. And we've been uh, cooperating with uh, businesses, with uh, governments, with the uh, citizens. So tell us a little bit about this, about Fair Lack and the implications that it has at the end of the day, because we're talking about these services that, that have focused on the person, on the individual, as Julio and Deselena were explaining. Let, let me let me unmute my microphone. It works better with that. Well, as Elena was saying, uh, President, everything that is innovation has to do with a joint work, and it is always teamwork. So let me take a second in order to bow to all the people in the bank who've worked with us, particularly the people at the IDB lab that launched a fair lack with us and who've been working on this. Uh, so kudos uh, to them. Regarding your question, we just did a study to see what we had by way of artificial intelligence in Latin America, essentially for social sectors. And what we found are three important things. So first of all, there's very little, very few about that. That is uh, the truth. Uh, we found uh, 30 interesting applications. 
And most of those that, that we found and that were discarded because we found others were simply apps that, that had to do with the linear econometry, not, our, not artificial intelligence, with models that had very few data. So we still have a long way to go. The other thing we found is that essentially the private sector is the one that is working on this. There's very little about this in the public sector. And something else that we found, and this will not be surprising, is that there are four countries where essentially these ideas are distributed. Argentina, Brazil, no doubt uh, Peru, and Mexico. So it's still quite uh, uneven in the sense of who's uh, dealing with this. Most of the things that we found are in education and health, and they're very promising things. But as I was saying, they're starting uh, to take their first steps uh, with this. So what is the work that we're doing with Fairlack and what is a major challenge? Well, we need to increase uh, the amount of interventions and to bring them to the public sector. And this is where things uh, get um, a bit more complex because of two things. The first one is because of what Elena was saying. In the public sector, we tend not to learn that quickly that the client or the user or the patient or the student have to be at the very center. When we talk about uh, technology, technology and artificial intelligence, we talk about the administrative side of things and the control of the system and not service to the user. And this uh, takes me back to the first question you asked, the importance of placing people at the very center. And something else that we found, and that is why it's called fair lack, is that increasingly more we see that as soon as we think about it and we start working with confidential data, particularly government, so we start dealing with privacy issues, cybersecurity, but also a question by the citizens, uh, President, as to why the algorithm will be used for, what for? And I was talking about the ability to predict uh, these algorithms and the technology. What people ask themselves is what it is uh, predicting and on the basis of what model can you show me what it's doing? So this is one of the greatest hurdles uh, that we currently have in order to bring artificial intelligence uh, to the state. And let me finish uh, with the following. So what are the promises of the AI? Well, the promises are to predict uh, who can drop out uh, from school. 50% of uh, boys and girls uh, drop out from school in Latin America to predict and to be able to work with them. If you have diabetic retinopathy, one of the endemic problems that, that we have, we can predict it before it becomes endemic. If uh, professors go to the places uh, where the richest uh, young people are because a model is discriminating them so we can help that model with the different models of artificial intelligence in order to bring them to where they need it. We're doing this in Peru and Ecuador. Sepsis, uh, hospital infections, uh, can we predict it? Yes, so we can do that. And we're working in Brazil with the state there in order to predict the uh, hospital sepsis. So the promise is there, the possibilities are there. We have to work well on these from the point of view of taking care of the client and knowing how to make sure that it be fair, that this be a fair app with privacy and security and protection of our users. Thank you very much, Marcelo. And he's not really passionate about this, as you can see. Well, Julio. A total reset, reset for humanity and a great moment to use a crisis for the better. How can we think of examples of what, it, what of the kinds of things that are coming as a result of COVID that can make our work both in, I mean, you know, you spoke a lot about education, but equally on health. What are the kinds of things that you're, you're looking at that can emerge as a result of the COVID crisis? Yes, thank you. So we actually came up, we like a term that uh, Martin Stewart Week in Australia has come up with, which he says it's innovation, a COVID innovation dividend. So thinking about how can we actually move from uh, a moment of forced experimentation, which is where many governments, many societies found themselves under COVID, to actually a moment where experimentation and exploring becomes a, you know, part of a new way of doing business, both for the public and the private sector, taking stock of what has happened. So what we've seen, you know, we talked to a number of different governments uh, looking at some of the unprecedented measures that they've taken in the last few months. Uh, and the general feeling was, you know, what has happened in the last few months is uh, compounds for what was happening in the last previous 10 years. So we've seen tremendous feats, uh, whether you're looking at, uh, you know, standing up hospitals from nothing, repurposing existing infrastructure, uh, in India, they repurposed 100,000 uh, 
carriages of trains uh, as ambulances um, uh, almost overnight. In, uh, in many countries, you've seen, as you mentioned before, telehealth uh, sectors being, you know, first of all, they were illegal or at least greatly legal, almost illegal in many countries, and overnight they were turned to be legals. And not only that, but the government had to actually uh, figure out how to create the sector almost overnight. In, in Indonesia, they went from zero to uh, almost 40 million users uh, uh, with a rethinking procurement and actually how they worked with, with startups across the country. Uh, so you've seen this, some amazing um, feats in terms of actually how uh, governments have repurposed their R&D, for example, in. Uh, Vietnam, they were able to produce low-cost test kits uh, much faster by planting three different parallel experiments uh, using, uh, you know, a different way of process that usually the private sector does to actually accelerate uh, investments. So how do we take this forward? How do we move this into uh, not just an exception, but actually a new way of exploring, a new way of doing things? If things were possible before, uh, we thought they were impossible and now all of a sudden are possible. How do we maintain this momentum? What are the, the, the capabilities that we need to think through? Uh, what are the new ways of doing things? Again, so if you think about uh, some of the challenges the governments are facing at the moment is uh, a fundamental unpredictability of the disease, which means that you need to take, as you know, one prime minister said, 100% of decision with 50% of the knowledge. Uh, if you project that probably more and more this is going to be the case, unfortunately, with more emergency and unpredictable events coming our way, what type of new skills do you need to develop for a public sector to operate under these circumstances? And this is where, again, you start thinking about, for example, uh, simulations in some governments. Uh, you work and you can get to a de your desk. You get the fake headlines saying, you know, your city is under flooding. And you need to move into emergency mode just to test and try how you actually operate. What would you do under this type of circumstances? How can you develop this way of thinking about potential different possible scenarios and futures? How can you provide experiences that actually give people a sense of what it means to believe in that condition of uncertainty? How do you rethink procurement? As I mentioned, this has been one of the great heroes uh, um, for better or for worse in the last few months in terms of thinking new ways of, of doing things and accelerating processes. How do you rethink R&D? Uh, as Elena will tell us much more, right? So this question about distributed capacity and expertise in the population that is activated all of a sudden. And this is distributed R&D that is typically not taken into account in innovation policies from countries. Uh, how do you actually harness that? Um, uh, and, and then maybe finally, the, the, the question about how do you rethink, uh, again, going back to our theme, right? For example, for education. So as far as I know, you know, University of Sydney is the only one so far in the world that is starting to teach a course on COVID right now. And students have to work on, yeah, so real-time institutions reacting to real-time challenges uh, and actually trying to uh, bridge the gap between, you know, the, the academia and actually real world uh, situations. How do we do this? Um, I think these are all examples of how we can radically uh, rethink and take advantage of some of the constraints that have been created by COVID, but also the opportunities. And then, of course, as Marcelo mentioned, the whole question about contactless services, the contactless economy moving forward is becoming more and more important, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Julio and, and Elena. How can, you know, one of the big questions is when I listen to what you were saying, a good example is the race for the vaccines right now. And the big question is how do you scale them up? And not to have uh, the world produces something like 5 million vaccines a year, now we need 7 billion. Uh, in your case, as you think, uh, in the ways that you talk about patient innovation, how can we scale up many of the things that you are doing and that will change fundamentally our health systems as we move more in the direction of a, of a universal health system, which is what is needed and what is critical and what developed countries have done for a long time? 
I think this is one of the problems because when we are talking about the uh, individual persons, the, the capacity of uh, do things that are scalable um, is much lower than when we think on big enterprises. But in fact, these type of solutions can sometimes be have a, 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 a price that is so low that is possible with, uh, uh, for instance, sharing the code. Of course, there are lots of problems with cybersecurity, as Marcelo mentioned, uh, but um, there are lots of open sources. And one of the examples are, for instance, the 3D printer. I, I think 3D printers are uh, also, uh, revolutionizing uh, lots of uh, um, different um, needs and also uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, economies and uh, we are now producing prothesis for kids that don't have a limb because uh, they they born without a part of the end or uh, of the um, forearm and there is um, a huge um, uh, movement that is called enable that was found it in the United States and they started to uh, share the code and now we can print an end for a kid and customize in every corner of, of the world. So it's very cheap to produce a prosthesis that can be replaced every, every year because the cost is 10 euros or 20 year, euros and not the, the um, thousand of euros that a, a, a prosthesis costs. So one of, of the, the good things of the technology is the possibility of helping in this um, scalability. Um, but at the same time, we need to be smart um, in using that and talking about COVID. In one day, we lock down every, every university, every school. And in, in Portugal, uh, we started by and with the universities is really is easy to to do the the teach classes by um, using the computer and using some of the um, softwares that are now available and we are using to do this type of meetings and it's easy for classes but it's not easy for the families that have little kids um, they don't have computers for all they sometimes they have a tablet but not computers and what uh, the government uh, did in Portugal was to back to the uh, 70s when we have the TV school uh, classes using the TV and uh, uh, in the 70s in Portugal in rural areas there was the Telescola uh, is the, the school by using TV and the government picked this example and um, have a schedule and an agenda and every day um, there is met between eight and nine for the seventh uh, grade. Then sciences for the nine uh, uh, grade. So with the telescola, with the, the TV school, um, the, the, even for people that didn't have the, the computer, uh, the, the, the kids uh, received the, the classes. And this was a solution that was used before the computers. And the, uh, the, they um, picked the, the uh, past uh, solution and used now uh, in the present. So I think there are smart solutions that we have. And if we are smart and reuse them, we can um, uh, democratize and uh, use for uh, a new scale for these innovations. 
with with the the vaccines and the, the the new drugs that are very expensive sometimes we need to to choose and we need to um, as marcel said to 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 know what are the people that will benefit from this and we know for instance with covid that there are groups that are more vulner vulnerable to the disease and we need to vaccine first the people that are more vulnerable than, than the others um, and we with this type of knowledge we can select and at the same time uh, can buy and pay um, the, the, the drugs, the vaccines for people that uh, uh, need more uh, uh, th this type of innovation. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Elena. Se nos está Thank you very el... much, Elena. We're running out of time, but I wanted to ask uh, Marcelo. Everybody here has uh, spoken about uh, all these uh, changes uh, concentrated on services to people, be it in education or in health. How long will it take you to see all these new things uh, that are emerging? And um, when will we see them uh, become a reality? And most of all, to scale them up. No microphone for Marcelo. Marcelo needs a microphone. I'll never learn. Don't worry. I was uh, just uh, confessing, and I'm from Argentina, as you know, I love tango. I tend to be a pessimist, uh, but uh, let me share with you at least uh, a ray of sunshine in what might happen. I agree wholeheartedly with what Ines said in the presentation. We know much more, we can experiment much more, and I believe that today we have a more people working around these issues. So President, what you will see is if all goes well in five years, we will have education, particularly at secondary level and health uh, at the level of uh, solving chronic uh, diseases that uh, shows and proves that in these uh, time of, of COVID, these six months of COVID, uh, we've moved forward four or five years. So what we had in 15 years, you'll have it in seven or seven and a half years. That's my prediction. If you want, we can place a bet on that, but that's my prediction. So thank you very much, Marcelo, Julio, Elena, and obviously Ines. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I believe that this is the most important conversation that we will hold in our hemisphere in the years to come. Because if we go back and think about what was going on last year, the huge demonstrations on the streets of Latin America, they all had to do with this. Not about the opportunity or the services that we had, but the lack of these services, the quality of the services, and the fact that they were not focused essentially on people. And because of that, I loved uh, that uh, Inez uh, brought uh, to our conversation that wonderful Colombian citizen. He's a great value of uh, the whole of Latin America, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And he used to say, in thinking about the pandemic, said life is uh, by, but a continuous succession of opportunities to be able to survive. That's what he said. So I believe uh, that we have a lot of uh, that wisdom. And I thank you all for having spent this moment with us. Uh, and we will continue with this conversation undoubtedly in the future. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.